Tonight, the secret war between Al-Qaeda and U.S. intelligence, which led to 9-11. From Pakistan and Afghanistan, through the Philippines, to New York and Washington. A decade-long trail of intrigue and espionage. The covert CIA plot to assassinate Osama bin Laden. I could tell you where he was last night, but I couldn't tell you where he was going to be tonight. And the intelligence failure which let the hijackers in. 16 of the 19 shouldn't have gotten into the United States in any way at all. An inside account of what was going on behind the scenes on 9-11. Evacuate the White House. The panic at the White House. We decided to evacuate the compound. Aboard Air Force One, the president was out of touch. That was a very, very frightening moment. The military was in the dark. A fighter pilot planned to ram into a hijacked airliner. Well, I'd have one hand on the stick and the other on the ejection handle. Tonight, a feature documentary presentation. The secret history of 9-11. The long road to 9-11 begins eight and a half years earlier on February 26, 1993, when an unremarkable motorcade makes its way through the streets of New Jersey, just across the Hudson River from Manhattan. In the lead is a rider rental van. The driver is Ramzi Youssef, a Pakistani who had claimed refugee status in the United States. In the back of the van are 500 kilograms of high-grade liquid explosives. This is the first attack on the World Trade Center, and it is very nearly foiled because of the incompetence of the plotters. They almost run out of gas and have to stop on the way to the target. A Jersey City police patrol happens by and takes an interest in them. Ramsey Yusuf decides to outweigh the police by pretending to have engine trouble. His stalling works. Just before noon, the motorcade enters the basement garage of the World Trade Center and the van is parked near a pillar of the North Tower. Yusuf lights four separate 20-foot fuses. He wants to make sure there is no failure. The bombers make their escape. The fuses will take 12 minutes to carry the fire to the blasting caps. The first Muslim extremist attack in the United States occurs at 12.17 p.m. <laughs> the conspirators had hoped to bring down the towers but the bomb was not that powerful. It did cause the panicked evacuation of the World Trade Center, as well as six deaths and over 1,000 injured. The van was quickly traced to a circle of Islamic militants who frequented a mosque in Brooklyn. Police began making arrests. Most of the suspects had come to the United States as immigrants from all over the Muslim world. They were not previously associated with any identifiable terrorist organization. The investigation was followed closely at the White House by the man who served as head of counterterrorism in both the Clinton and Bush administrations. 
Richard Clark wondered if some new multinational terrorist group could be responsible. The FBI and CIA couldn't, could not answer the question. And they implied that these were just people who all coincidentally hated the United States and somehow, somewhere had met and decided, let's blow up the World Trade Center. And it just it seemed incredible. And, and what we said to them at the time was, what are you telling us? This is a pickup basketball game? You know, a bunch of um, people who hate the United States from a half dozen countries coincidentally bump into each other somewhere and you don't know where and sit around uh, smoking the hookah and saying, let's blow up the World Trade Center, and it didn't make any sense. The FBI established that the mastermind of the World Trade Center bombing was Ramzi Youssef. Minutes after the attack, he had sent a message to the New York Times claiming the bombing was in retaliation for American support of Israel and oppression of the Palestinian people. Then he left New York on the evening flight to Pakistan. Investigators lost his trail for almost two years. The next time Ramzi Yusuf turned up was in the Philippine city of Manila. He had rented one of the Josefa apartments here on Quireno Avenue. he turned the apartment into a bomb factory. He was working on a new plan to attack the United States. He developed a nitroglycerin type explosive that he would conceal in empty bottles of contact lens fluid. He designed a timing mechanism with Casio watches and a detonator powered by nine volt batteries, which he hid in the heels of boots. All this was to sneak explosives onto airplanes, and Yusuf decided to test out his plan on a Philippine Airlines flight on December 11, 1994. He had no trouble passing his small test bomb through security at the Manila airport. On board the flight, he slipped his bomb into a pocket under his seat. Then he got off the plane at its next stop. The flight continued on to Japan. At 11.43 a.m., just off the coast of Okinawa, the bomb exploded. Luckily, the pilots were able to make an emergency landing. One passenger was killed. Ten were injured. Investigators like Philippine Police Superintendent Sonny Razon were baffled. At that time, it was a big question mark. Uh, even uh, the authorities in uh, Japan had difficulty piecing it together. But we know at the time that uh, there was a bomb sneaked into the aircraft. But who did it? Why? Uh, that was left hanging. The answer soon emerged. Less than a month later, there was an accident at Ramzi Yusuf's Manila apartment. On the night of January 6, 1995, Yusuf and an accomplice were mixing chemicals when they miscalculated and started a fire. <laughs> Choking smoke filled the apartment. The two men fled. Within minutes, police were on their way to investigate. Inside the Josefa apartment, police found religious garments which would allow bombers to disguise themselves as priests. They found pipe bombs and other evidence which revealed a plot to assassinate Pope John Paul II who was arriving within days to visit the Philippines. But the most devastating plot was discovered on Yusuf's computer. Codenamed Bujinka, it was a complicated scheme that showed how a team of operatives could simultaneously bomb a dozen U.S. airline flights from Asia to the United States. 
the attack would kill up to 4,000 people in one day. I was amazed. Takes a lot of planning, takes a lot of coordination. See, so it would tell you that it's not only Yusef alone doing it. Ramzi Yusuf managed to escape the Philippines, but police were able to arrest his accomplice, Abdul Hakim Murad. In an interrogation that went on for weeks, Murad revealed an even larger plot to attack U.S. landmarks with aircraft. He admitted that he is a trained pilot. He was precisely recruited for that to undertake a mission, fly a small aircraft loaded with explosives, and even volunteered that uh, one possible target is uh, the CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. In 1995, Ramzi Yusuf's plot to attack U.S. landmarks with aircraft was taken seriously. The CIA issued a national intelligence estimate which said several targets are especially at risk. National symbols such as the White House and the Capitol, and symbols of U.S. capitalism such as Wall Street. We assess that civilian aviation will figure prominently among possible terrorist targets in the United States. That CIA report was over six years before 9-11. In January 1995, the investigation of the first World Trade Center attack made a major breakthrough. Philippine police discovered a fingerprint in the bomber's Manila apartment. It was traced to Ramzi Yusuf, who had escaped back to Pakistan. Now, however, he was the target of a worldwide manhunt directed from the White House. So when we put together the fact that the man who had been the ringleader of the World Trade Center attack in 93 was now planning to bomb American aircraft with these sophisticated bombs in 95. Uh, we thought, my God, this guy is the real thing. He's a, a major threat. Uh, and it's him personally involved in these things. Uh, we have to find him. In Pakistan, the manhunt for Ramzi Yusuf intensified. Aircraft dropped 37,000 matchbooks, which featured his picture and a $2 million reward for information leading to his arrest. It worked. On February 7, 1995, Ramzi Yusuf was arrested in Islamabad. He had been betrayed for money by one of his accomplices. Yusuf was picked up in Pakistan by a U.S. military plane. The flight back to the United States would take 26 hours. The FBI did not want to touch down in any country that could challenge its jurisdiction over Ramzi Yusuf, and so the plane was refueled numerous times in the air. Once in New York, Yusuf was taken by helicopter into downtown Manhattan. He was in the custody of the lead FBI agent in the World Trade Center investigation, Bill Gavin. New York uh, just looked beautiful that night. Crystal clear, crisp, lights twinkling. And as, uh, of course, we had him with the hood on. And as we come down the river, we took the hood off and uh, got to about 34th Street, where the Empire State Building was out on one side. I said to him, look straight ahead, see that run to you? Trade centers are still standing there, aren't they? In his little accent, he said, they wouldn't be if I had enough money and enough explosives. Right up to that moment, the bravado was incredible. Yusuf was sentenced to 240 years in prison. He gave only one interview to the Arabic newspaper Al Hayat. He told correspondent Ragita Duran about a new Islamic militant group that would rise up to challenge the United States. 
he was speaking about a network an international network, a network all over, different countries, different nationalities. Eventually I said, my goodness, he was talking about the Qaeda. He was telling us a lot about the Qaeda. Ramzi Youssef might have given some key clues about Al Qaeda and its intentions, but few in the US government were listening. Thomas Kane, the chair of the National Commission investigating 9-11, says that American authorities made a grave mistake by not pursuing Yusuf's backers. They felt they had their man. We had caught Yusuf, and he was the mad bomber, as far as we were concerned. He was the one who tried to blow up who, who, who World Trade Center one. He was the one who tried to do the Bajinka plot. He was the one who tried to get the Pope and blow him up. He was the one who wanted to get the president when he was in the middle and blow him up. I mean, this was, this was a one-man squad to try and blow up people. But Yusuf was not a one-man squad. While in prison, he made a key mistake and placed a call to his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. American investigators soon realized Mohammed had provided financing for the first World Trade Center attack and had played a central role in the plot against US commercial airliners. He would go on to become the mastermind of the 9-11 operation. In 1995, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed had taken refuge in the Persian Gulf state of Qatar. Members of the royal family there were known supporters of Islamic militants. The U.S. government decided to try to kidnap Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and bring him back to face American justice. But Richard Clark says there was no great enthusiasm for the job. So we asked CIA if they could um, go into Qatar without the permission of the local authorities and secretly snatch this guy. Didn't seem like a big request. Well, it turned out it was. CIA, after a lot of uh, analysis, came back and said, no, they couldn't do it. They didn't have the capability. It flabbergasted me. Uh, and we then turned to the military and said, well, can you go in and snatch him? And they came back with a plan that was akin to the invasion of the country. I mean, it wasn't a small 12-person unit jumping out of a couple of Chevy Suburbans. It was something that even the Cutteries would have seen coming. Um, so we were somewhat stuck. And we escalated this so that it was discussed at the cabinet level. The Clinton cabinet decided to appeal directly to the emir of Qatar for assistance in the arrest and extradition of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Shortly after we had that contact, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed fled the country. So it does seem that someone in the Qatari government, even though we tried very hard to restrict the information to senior levels of the government, somebody tipped him off uh, and he got away. After his escape, the FBI issued a wanted poster for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He was indicted in the United States on charges related to the plot against U.S. aircraft but American investigators lost his trail. He would come back to haunt them. Muhammad had disappeared into Afghanistan, where he would pursue his dream of attacking the United States with commercial airliners. He would find a new backer for his plans, the mysterious Saudi financier, Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden came to the attention of U.S. intelligence agencies during the investigation of the first World Trade Center bombing. His name appeared on a list of suspects who might have financed the operation. At the time, bin Laden had taken up residence in Sudan under the protection of the Islamic fundamentalist regime there. I think I probably heard about Osama bin Laden in 1993 for the first time. And the CIA, uh, whenever it reported about activities of a man named Osama bin Laden, uh, would say Osama bin Laden, comma, terrorist financier, 
comma. And we began asking in 1994, let's take a closer look at this guy, because his name pops up in a lot of places. He may be doing more than just writing checks. By 1996, Osama bin Laden had moved to Afghanistan and called upon the Muslim world to wage war against Americans. The CIA had formed an entire unit devoted to following bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. The first chief of the CIA bin Laden unit was Mike Scheuer. By the end of 96, it, it was apparent that, that bin Laden was much more than, a, than a, you know, a tall Saudi spendthrift, that he was a very articulate man and a very much a, a odd combination of a, of a medieval theologian and a 21st century CEO. He was someone who could manage an organization and drive it toward particular goals. In the next few years, Osama bin Laden methodically built up Al-Qaeda. In 1997, he opened his training camps near Khost, Afghanistan. Mujahideen from all over the world arrived to receive elaborate military instruction. Bin Laden invited journalists and camera crews to visit his camps, and he even demonstrated his prowess with an AK-47 assault rifle. In May 1998, Osama bin Laden called a press conference to announce he was joining forces with the Egyptian group Islamic Jihad. Pakistani journalist Rahimullah Yousafzai traveled to Afghanistan to attend that press conference. We spent about five hours with him. We interviewed him. In this press conference, he announced the creation of the International Islamic Front for Jihad against the U.S. and Israel. And he said that Al-Qaeda was merging in this front that very day. Bin Laden published a 12-page declaration of war against the United States. The CIA bin Laden unit was impressed. It was a learned document. It wasn't a wild man saying, I declare war against you. Uh, it was a very reasoned document. And I think that's what caught the eye of most of the people who work, were working against bin Laden, that this guy is something different than we have seen before. How was it received in Washington? It was blown off. Um, yeah, you know, bin Laden and what power is going to declare war on the United States? By 1998, there was a new power allied with bin Laden. The Taliban had seized control of Afghanistan and were imposing draconian religious laws on the population. Mullah Omar, the reclusive head of the Taliban, protected bin Laden as a guest in his country. But even he worried that al-Qaeda was becoming a state within a state. Mullah Omar called me from Kandahar saying, were you in this press conference in Khost with bin Laden? I said, yes. He said, how did you go there? I said, we were taken by a Kashmiri Mujahideen group. We were smuggled across the border. He said, did you have a visa? I said, no. And he said, how come he gave a press conference in my country? He said, there can be only one ruler of this country. It's either me or bin Laden. Just 20 kilometers outside Kandahar, Afghanistan, is a former agricultural compound named Tarnak Farm. American bombing reduced it to rubble after 9-11, because for four years, this was the home of Osama bin Laden. He moved in here at the insistence of Mullah Omar, who wanted to keep a closer eye on him. In 1998, the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency started tracking bin Laden. The CIA used satellite photography and local spies to follow his every move. It's an exaggeration, but he was almost like a blue-collar guy. He'd get his lunch pail in the morning and uh, leave Tarnak Farm and drive up to Kandahar and check on his businesses and have lunch and deal with Mullah Omar and come back at the end of the day. The CIA developed a plan to arrest bin Laden and bring him to the U.S. to stand trial. 
A team of Afghan commandos was hired for the operation. In charge was the CIA's station chief in Islamabad, Gary Schroen. So the plan would, would, would have called for about 35 or 40 of these Afghan fighters to sneak into the, the camp. Uh, we knew the three houses that bin Laden owned and personally that he had his wives stationed in and he rotated between those three houses when he was there. So we would attack those three houses, trying to do it with the minimum amount of, of noise or whatever, grab him, and then they had a way of, uh, there was a, a culvert that ran under the wall and take him out that way. The Tarnak Farm kidnap operation was scheduled for the night of June 23rd, 1998. Then, just before it was to go ahead, there was a debate at the White House about how many people were likely to be killed. I said, well, there will be a gunfight. There's no way that once an alarm is raised that these guys aren't going to pour out of their homes with AK-47s and all. And so I think that was one of the, probably the deciding factor in, in, in you know, when the plan was presented where it was just simply finally rejected. While the U.S. government hesitated about attacking Osama bin Laden, he attacked them. On August 7, 1998, the U.S. African embassies in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi were almost destroyed by truck bombs. 224 people died, including 12 Americans. Over 5,000 were injured. The investigation led straight to Osama bin Laden. In the Situation Room at the White House, Clinton's national security team decided to hit back with cruise missiles. The CIA had received information that bin Laden would be meeting other Al-Qaeda leaders at one of his Afghanistan training camps on August 20th, 1998. The cruise missiles fired from the Arabian Sea, traveled over Pakistan, and landed in the Afghan training camps. But narrowly missed bin Laden. Bill Clinton's crisis management team was disappointed, according to the president's deputy national security advisor, James Steinberg. We had hoped and there was some reason to think that bin Laden might be there, and he wasn't at the time of the attack. And so it, it is a reminder that this is a very, very difficult thing to do. And that there's, that as people have correctly said, there's a limited effectiveness to this particular tactic in dealing with this kind of problem. Cruise missiles are not well designed to deal with this kind of threat. After the failure of the cruise missile attack, President Clinton reversed his position and authorized the CIA to kidnap Osama bin Laden. But now it would be more difficult. He was no longer the blue-collar guy in the lunch bucket. He, he was moving at different times of the day in different vehicles. Um, he was staying overnight in places away from Tarnak Farm. So we revived it, but the chances of success were marginal uh, after, after the cruise missile attack. I could tell you where he was last night but I couldn't tell you where he was going to be tonight. And that was every day it was like that. So you couldn't get ahead of him. You couldn't get your guys, our guys, out in front of him. We were always trailing about a half a day behind. In late December 1998, CIA field agents were finally able to get ahead of Osama bin Laden. They received a tip that he would be coming to visit Kandahar. He would be staying overnight here at the governor's mansion. American ships in the Arabian Sea prepared their cruise missiles to strike the governor's mansion. CIA agent Gary Schroen emailed headquarters, hit him tonight, we may not get another chance. 
at the White House, the military doubted the intelligence and estimated that a cruise missile strike would kill or injure over 200 people. In the end, the attack was cancelled. It struck me as rather insane, frankly. They decided not to attack bin Laden because he was in a building in fairly close proximity to a mosque. And they were afraid that some of the shrapnel was going to hit the mosque and somehow offend the Muslim world. And so they decided not to uh, shoot on that occasion. And that's the kind of, of uh, reason for not shooting that, they, that, that the policymaker, anyway, came up with endlessly. You raise your right hand and then put your under. The missed opportunities to capture or kill Osama bin Laden in the 1990s were a key topic in the investigations of the 9-11 Commission. Vice Chair Lee Hamilton defends the policymakers at the Clinton White House. There's always the question that arises, uh, who else are you going to kill? Uh, if they're with other people, uh, what's the collateral damage going to be? How many women and children are going to die? Uh, how many innocent people are going to die? And those are decisions that a political leader, have, uh, they have to wrestle with those. The Clinton administration's last good chance to kill Osama bin Laden was at a falcon hunting camp in southern Afghanistan in 1999. Falcon hunting is wildly popular with the ultra-rich throughout the Arab world. The CIA followed bin Laden to the camp and determined that he was going to stay for a few days. But satellite photos also revealed the presence of a military C-130 aircraft from the United Arab Emirates, indicating that senior officials from the UAE government were hunting with bin Laden. Once again, the White House decided to stand down. They did not want to take the chance of killing some of America's closest allies in the Persian Gulf. Look, these guys know who bin Laden is. They know he's... he's sponsored murder, he's maimed and killed thousands of, of Muslims, and they're, they're hosting him, they're welcoming him, they're, get, they're treating him nicely. My, as I said to my wife when I came home, then I said, well, you know, if you lie down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. And these guys are lying down with the biggest dog in the world, and we ought to take the shot. And the consequences to them, you know, that's, well, too bad. Members of President Clinton's national security team say they were less concerned about the cost of hitting bin Laden and his friends, and more preoccupied with the cost of missing. You don't want to look like you can't succeed. The one thing we were very conscious of is that to, to undertake a number of attacks that failed would not only not achieve our purpose, but actually strengthen bin Laden and his group. It would look like that we, we, we couldn't get him, uh, and that, that we were ineffective in getting them. In December 2000, when George W. Bush was finally declared the winner of the U.S. presidential election, he sat down for a private meeting with Bill Clinton at the White House. In that meeting, Clinton says he told Bush that al-Qaeda was the biggest threat to the United States and that not catching or killing bin Laden was one of the greatest regrets of his presidency. Did Bill Clinton want bin Laden dead? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Bill Clinton had an enormous frustration that he had ordered, Bill uh, Clinton had ordered uh, al-Qaeda leaders, not just bin Laden, um, to be arrested. That didn't work. Uh, and then he changed the order and said, well, since it's evident that you can't arrest them, you're authorized to kill them. And nothing happened. And he really didn't understand why CIA was so ineffective uh, and couldn't do that. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office. On January 20th, 2001, George W. Bush was sworn in as President of the United States. Five days later, Bush received a memo from his White House counterterrorism director, Richard Clark, 
saying, we urgently need a principles level review of the Al-Qaeda network. That urgently required meeting would not take place for almost nine months. For the new Bush administration, Al-Qaeda was a low priority. In the months leading up to 9-11, while the White House and the CIA were not paying much attention, Osama bin Laden pressed ahead with his preparations to attack the United States. We can now reconstruct what was going on inside Al-Qaeda. Because of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of the 9-11 operation. He had been wanted in the United States for years on terrorism charges. Arrested in 2003, Muhammad became a key source of information for the 9-11 Commission. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, he's the one who really got the plot going, originated the plot, uh, talked about how to hire the hijackers and all of that. So he knows more about it than anybody else who's still alive. And so he was immensely important. The testimony of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was recently introduced into evidence in a U.S. court. The testimony is based on hours of interrogations. Mohammed proudly described how he sold bin Laden on the idea for the 9-11 attacks and how they settled on methods and targets. After the 1993 attacks on the World Trade Center, I decided that explosives and bombs could be problematic. And so I focused on using airplanes as weapons. The most attractive targets were high buildings both for their relative ease of targeting, as well as for the symbolic impact. Bin Laden expressed his desire to simultaneously hit the Pentagon, the White House, and the United States Capitol building. He had Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khaled al-Mihdar in mind for the operation. Khaled al-Mihdar and Nawaf al-Hazmi were al-Qaeda recruits from Saudi Arabia. They had obtained visas to the United States with the hope that Osama bin Laden would send them there on a suicide mission. They were the first two hijackers assigned to the 9-11 plot. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed gave the two men a basic training course for their mission. He showed them Hollywood movies to teach them how hijackers could seize control of airplanes. He used a flight simulator program to show them the basics of piloting. The program would allow them to practice crashing into buildings. At the time, he did not tell them all the details of his plan. I told these two that they were being sent to the United States for flight training. They weren't provided with the specific targets of the operation. When they left for the United States, even I didn't know what they would be. Khalid al-Midhar and Nawaf al-Hazmi became the focus of the greatest intelligence failure in U.S. history because American agents had been following them almost two years before 9-11. Their trail was first picked up in December 1999 by the U.S. National Security Agency which monitors international telephone traffic. An agent was listening in on a telephone line in Yemen that had been previously used by Osama bin Laden. He heard arrangements being made for a trip involving al-Midhar and al-Hazmi. Both had already been identified as al-Qaeda agents. The CIA tracked the two men as they flew to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and had them followed. They were photographed with other Al-Qaeda suspects at a meeting at this condominium on the outskirts of Kuala Lumpur. Then, the CIA lost their trail. One week later, the two men flew into the United States and landed at Los Angeles International Airport. The CIA knew that Khalid al-Midhar had a U.S. visa, and yet that information was not shared with the FBI or U.S. immigration. The two names did not appear on the list of suspected terrorists kept at all U.S. entry points, 
and so the men had no trouble slipping through the net. This was one of the most terrible things we found out in our work, in that the intelligence agencies had cultures where they kept things very much to themselves, and they didn't share information with other intelligence agencies. Had they shared information, very possible a plot would have been disrupted. The two Al-Qaeda suspects made their way to San Diego. Before long, they both had driver's licenses, and Nawaf al-Hazmi was even listed in the San Diego phone book. The two men signed up for lessons at a local flight school, but they were completely lacking in natural abilities. After a few sessions, their instructor, Rick Garza, told them that there was just no point in continuing. They seemed to have a very strong interest in flying larger aircraft, and that's when they brought up the subject of flying Boeings. Where can we learn to fly Boeings? And uh, I just kind of chuckled a little bit, and I said, it's, it's, gonna, it's a long road before you get to Boeings, you know, several years from now. But um, you have to start out in the smaller aircraft. If you can't fly the, the little four-seat aircraft, there's no way you're going to be able to fly a Boeing. The two men reported back to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed that learning to fly was a lot more difficult than expected. He was surprised. Bin Laden and I never considered whether any special skills or talents were needed to pilot an aircraft. We thought that uh, learning to fly an airplane was much like learning to drive a car. It was easily accomplished with the correct instructions. It was a mistake in judgment. The Al-Qaeda leadership decided that they needed hijackers to pilot the planes who would be much more proficient in English and comfortable in the West. University students Mohammed Atta, Zayed Jarrah, and Marwan al-Shehi had just shown up in Afghanistan to train for jihad and were immediately assigned to the 9-11 operation. Another recent Al-Qaeda recruit, Hani Hanjour, was already trained as a pilot. I wanted Hanjour to pilot the plane that would strike the Pentagon, given that the Pentagon would be a tough target because it is not a tall building. I figured that Hanjour would be the best qualified of the pilots. While Al-Qaeda was relentlessly pushing forward with the 9-11 plot, U.S. intelligence found a new weapon in its secret war against Osama bin Laden. A year before 9-11, a new American weapon appeared in Afghanistan that could have dealt Al-Qaeda a mortal blow. The Predator was an unmanned aircraft, remotely piloted by CIA technicians in neighboring countries or even back in the United States. The drone was equipped with a camera that would beam back real-time video images to CIA headquarters. On its very first flight over bin Laden's home at Tarnak Farm on September 7, 2000, the Predator captured video of a tall man dressed in white, surrounded by commandos dressed in black. CIA headquarters was convinced it was Osama bin Laden. Three weeks later, another flight captured a very similar scene. I was able to see the film uh, at headquarters uh, mm -hmm. after the fact, and so it was a great step forward. And then there was a lot of talk about uh, you know, arming the, the, the Predator so that it, we could actually uh, launch missiles you know, against a target once we spotted it. Um, and that took a, a while to develop uh, that capability. Mm -hmm. As work proceeded on arming the Predator with Hellfire missiles, the new weapon became the focus of infighting in Washington. The CIA argued that it should not have to pay for the Predator or to replace it if it crashed. 
it wanted the Defense Department to foot the bill. At the White House, Richard Clark reacted with a blistering memo. He wrote, either Al-Qaeda is a threat worth acting against or it is not. CIA leadership has to decide which it is and cease these bipolar mood swings. Clark knew, however, that he was now widely dismissed as being obsessive about Osama bin Laden. Now, an awful lot of people looked at bin Laden and said, well, you know, he really hasn't done that much. Prior to 9-11, people thought that. You know, they said, well, on one day he attacked two embassies and 17 Americans were killed. And on another day he attacked a U.S. destroyer and 19 Americans were killed. But all told, the number of Americans killed by bin Laden was, you know, less than 50 over the course of a decade. And some people said, you know, 50 Americans die every time we have a three-day weekend in holiday crashes. Get a grip, Dick. Get perspective. It's not a big threat. Meanwhile in Afghanistan, Osama bin Laden took a personal role in training the men who would become the so-called muscle hijackers on 9-11 the men who would storm the cockpit and control the passengers. We instructed the muscle hijackers to focus on seizing the cockpit first and then worry about seizing control over the rest of the plane. They did not learn the full details of the operation, including the fact that the planes they hijacked would be flown into buildings until they reached the United States in the spring and summer of 2001. The muscle hijackers began arriving in the United States. Many of them were allowed through immigration, despite incomplete travel documents that should have kept them out. 16 of the 19 shouldn't have gotten into the United States in any way at all, because there was something wrong with their visas, something wrong with their passports. They should have simply have been stopped at the border. That was 16 of the 19. Obviously, if even half of those people had been stopped, it never would have been a plot. In the spring and summer of 2001, U.S. intelligence began hearing chatter about the 9-11 plot. A CIA informant reported that Osama bin Laden was interested in using commercial pilots as terrorists. On June 22nd, the Federal Aviation Administration issued a bulletin to airlines, warning of a possible hijacking plot by Islamic terrorists. On June 25th, there was a threat advisory to all government agencies warning about the high probability of imminent spectacular terrorist attack by Al-Qaeda. The Deputy Secretary of State saw all of those warnings. Richard Armitage. There were a lot of reports in the early summer of uh, 2001 uh, that uh, the terrorists were planning something that was unknown. There was a one speculation that airplanes could be used. And I remember George Tennant, the then director of CIA, running around town, pounding on desks, saying, something's going to happen. I don't know when and where, but it's going to happen. Perhaps the biggest warning came directly to the president. On August 6, 2001, while on vacation in Crawford, Texas, George Bush was given his presidential daily brief the headline is stark. Bin Laden determined to strike in U.S. The document suggested Al-Qaeda would follow the example of World Trade Center bomber Ramzi Yusuf and bring the fighting to America. It highlighted patterns of suspicious activity in this country consistent with preparations for hijackings or other types of attacks. But no action was taken. In that fateful summer of 2001, counterterrorism director Richard Clark decided he had had enough. He asked to be reassigned. So I thought, you know, maybe, maybe they're right. That it looks like uh, I'm Captain Ahab going after the white whale. And maybe if somebody else were in this job and came to the same conclusion that Al-Qaeda was a major threat, then maybe they'd believe them. In August 2001, the CIA finally shared some key intelligence that could have prevented the 9-11 attack. The CIA told the FBI that Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Midhar were Al-Qaeda agents with U.S. visas and should be tracked down. Unfortunately, the FBI request to find the two was labeled routine, giving the searchers 30 days to respond. 
The information on the two in Los Angeles came uh, too little, too late. There was no great sense of urgency here uh, that an attack was imminent and uh, we just didn't proceed as uh, urgently as we should have. FBI headquarters finally took notice that the two Al-Qaeda suspects had flown into Los Angeles 18 months earlier. And so this cable was sent to the FBI office in LA asking for their help in tracking Al-Midhar and Al-Hazmi. The cable is dated September 10th, 2001. All this investigation came just too late. On the morning of September 11th, this is Nawaf al-Hazmi in the blue shirt, going through the security checkpoint at Dulles Airport in Washington. With him is his younger brother, Selim al-Hazmi, pilot Hani Hanjour, and Khaled al-Midhar. They are boarding American Airlines Flight 77, the plane they would soon hijack and crash into the Pentagon. The intelligence failure was now complete, and the most devastating terrorist attack in U.S. history was underway. September 11, 2001 dawned bright and clear in New York City as an estimated 50,000 people made their way to work at the World Trade Center. It was a beautiful day too in Boston, where American Airlines Flight 11 took off from Logan Airport at 7.59 a.m. United Airlines Flight 175 took off from the same airport just 15 minutes later. At that exact moment, 8.14 a.m., the Al-Qaeda hijackers took control of the first plane, American 11. The first notification of the hijacking came from flight attendant Betty Ong, who phoned in the news to American Airlines at 8.19. Okay, my name is Betty Ong. I'm number three on flight 11. Okay. And the cockpit is not answering their phone. And there's somebody staffed in business class, and there's, we can't breathe in business class. Somebody's got mace or something. We can't breathe. I, I don't know. I think we're getting hijacked. On September 11th, the United States had a series of protocols for how to handle an airplane hijacking and involved the U.S. military. The system failed at almost every turn. Here was the first failure. The U.S. military would not hear about this hijacking for 18 crucial minutes. Civilian air traffic controllers found out about the hijacking when they first heard the voice of Al-Qaeda pilot Mohammed Atta in control of American 11 at 8.24 a.m. We have some planes. Just stay quiet and you'll be okay. We are turning to the airport. Nobody move. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any move, you will danger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. At 8.27 a.m., American 11 made a sharp turn to the south, heading for New York City. It took another 10 minutes before air traffic controllers in Boston finally notified the military. The Northeast Air Defense Sector in Rome, New York, happened to be in the middle of an exercise. All right, Boston Center Team U, we have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York, and we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some F-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. The U.S. military immediately called on the nearest fighter pilots to help out. At Otis Air Force Base in Cape Cod, Timothy Duffy and Daniel Nash were on call. We got a phone call at uh, 8.37, gave us a heads up that there was a possible hijacking. 
uh, I had a radio or brick uh, in my pocket, so I said Alpha Kilo 1 and 2 suit up. So that was for me and Nasty to, to go throw on our G-suits and grab our helmets and harnesses and all that. The horn goes off, lights go off, and, and we start going through the scramble procedures. It took several key minutes for the pilots to get into their jets. On the tarmac, a supervisor briefed them on the target. He filled me in on where we were as far as the American flight, being a 767 on its way to California. It was a suspected hijack, and he said, looks like the real thing, go. In the next few minutes, hijackers took control of the second plane, United 175, and turned it towards New York City. The Air Traffic Control Command Center in Herndon, Virginia, was still looking for the first hijacked plane. Operations Manager Ben Sliney. While we were trying to locate Flight 11, American 11, uh, the last report I had was some uh, 30 miles uh, north of New York City. New York Center was asking planes to look for it and uh, couldn't see it. And we would, I, I figured we'd try to get the people on the ground, the towers in the area, the police departments, anyone we could get uh, to give us some information on where this flight was. At 8.46 a.m., American 11 came in low over New York City and hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Fighter jets from Otis Air Force Base were not even in the area. They were only able to take off seven minutes later. It would take them 32 minutes to reach New York. They're heading right down Long Island, basically, uh, just offset a little bit over the water. And I just left it in full afterburner the whole way, trying to get there as quick as I could. But we had no idea what was going on. Just in, you were looking at a, obviously a very disturbing live shot there. That is the World Trade Center, and we have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. CNN Center right now is just three minutes after story. impact. CNN was broadcasting video of the hole in the North Tower. Clearly, something. There was speculation it was a small aircraft. The south end of the island of Manhattan. No, a small plane would bounce off that building and. You know, those buildings are just not in any flight path. In other words, it would be in on a clear, sparkling blue sky day. It's inconceivable that someone would run into the building. My eyes are seeing one thing and my brain is saying, well, that can't be true. It was only at 8.55 a.m. that New York air traffic control realized that the second aircraft had been hijacked. They phoned in a warning to the Air Traffic Control Command Center. Confusion reigned. Yeah, sure, the situation is going, going on here. It's uh, escalating big, big time. And we need to get the military involved with this. We're, we're involved with something else. We have other aircraft that may have a similar situation going on here. The responsibility to notify the military of what was going on in the skies on September 11th belonged to FAA headquarters in Washington, D.C. I do know that all the information was being relayed to headquarters, and at least as far as we were concerned, it should have been, uh, and we thought it had been given to the military that, uh, at each juncture. As it turned out, precious minutes would go by before anyone called the military about the second hijacked plane. New York air traffic controllers were busy tracking United 175 as it lost altitude and circled New York. I'm just out of 9,500, 9,000 now. Do you know who he is? We're just, we just, we don't know who he is. We're just picking him up now. All right, heads up, man. It looks like another one. All right. We knew that the aircraft was rapidly approaching New York City from New York Center, that it was diving and coming fast towards the city. That much we knew. Uh, beyond that, it happened within a minute or two. I think uh, uh, it was all over. Oh! 
the military only learned about the second hijacked aircraft at the very moment it crashed into the south tower of the World Trade Center at 9.03 a.m. The nearest jet fighters were still a long way off. I guess we were probably I'm about 60 miles out, 70 miles out from uh, Manhattan, and that's when they came back and said the second aircraft just hit the World Trade Center. Obviously, that was a shock to me because I thought there was only one. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, and it was probably better than 100 miles visibility, so from where we were, you could see everything very, very clearly. You could see both buildings burning. Officers at the Northeast Air Defense Sector had still not heard from FAA headquarters. At 9.08 a.m., Mission Crew Commander Kevin Nesipany began improvising the air defense of North America. This is what I foresee that we probably need to do. We need to talk to FAA. We need to tell them if this stuff's going to keep on going, we need to take those fighters and put them over Manhattan. That's the best thing. That's the best play right now. There are a lot of things going on through my mind, whether I was going to have to force aircraft down, or was I was going to have to shoot it down. My whole goal is to stop what was happening. People lose track of how much chaos there was. We were in a situation that was just a mess, you know, and we were trying to get our arms around it a little bit. The chaos on 9-11 was not just in the sky. Some of the worst confusion was around the president. Another huge command and control failure on 9-11 was on the political side. The president, of course, was visiting a school in Florida that morning. After hearing about the first crash into the World Trade Center, he insisted on carrying on with his planned activities. At 9.05 a.m., his chief of staff, Andrew Card, told him the second plane had hit the second tower, that America was under attack. He famously did nothing for almost seven minutes. He later said he was trying to project an image of calm. Meanwhile, at the White House, there was total confusion. Counterterrorism director Richard Clark arrived at the mansion at the same time as news of the second plane hit him. He realized the president was not there and went immediately to the office of the vice president. The vice president asked, what do you think is going on? And I, and I said, it's pretty clear to me when two buildings get hit simultaneously, more or less simultaneously, by two large aircraft, this is a terrorist attack in which means it's Al-Qaeda because no other terrorist organization has that kind of capability and intent. I also suggested to him it wasn't over and the president was a thousand miles away. The president was now in an adjacent classroom with his staff watching the events in New York on television. He was on the phone with the White House. We asked the president to stay away, uh, not to return to Washington because as far as we were concerned, Washington could be a combat zone. Uh, and the last thing in the world we wanted was the president to fly into a place that was about to blow up. The story of what went on behind the scenes with the president that day is still filled with mystery and controversy. Bush made his first televised statement to the nation at 9.30. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a difficult moment for America. And then his Secret Service bodyguards were supposed to whisk him away to Air Force One. Unfortunately, it turns out that the motorcade sped off in the wrong direction. After several kilometers, the Secret Service had to perform an embarrassing U-turn in order to head for the airfield. Inside the presidential limousine, there was more chaos. The president was trying to speak to his staff at the White House, but all the secure telephone lines were down. The communication system overloaded. Mr. Bush was reduced to trying to contact Washington on a borrowed cell phone, but even that didn't work. 
the president said to, to us, you know, I could not get, in, you know, for a while we just broke, the communications from the White House broke down. And I couldn't reach them. They couldn't reach me. And that was scary on both sides because the, the president is the only one who can give certain orders that need to be given. Mr. Bush expected the communications problem to be solved when he boarded Air Force One in Florida at 9.45 a.m. But the phones there worked only sporadically. In the case of any kind of an attack in the United States, what you're supposed to do is get the president off the ground. And Air Force One then becomes the command center. And the president is then safe and is commanding the forces of the United States from the air. Uh, the communications didn't work. The president's senior advisor, Karen Hughes, was trying to call him through the White House switchboard. And uh, the operator came back, and I remember his, his voice was kind of shaky, and he said, ma'am, we cannot reach Air Force One. And that was a very, very frightening moment, because, of course, the, I'd never had that happen before. On September 11th, not only was the president out of touch, the White House was left unprotected. At 9.30 a.m., two more jet fighters took off from Langley Air Force Base near Washington. But due to mistaken communication, they were given a flight plan which took them east out over the ocean. They went almost 250 kilometers in the wrong direction. In the White House, Richard Clark was wondering why there were no jet fighters overhead. We certainly asked right away for combat air patrol. I would guess uh, that probably the Defense Department had already requested it. Uh, it seemed like it took forever. Things were about to get worse. Shortly after 9 a.m., American Airlines realized that another of their planes, Flight 77, was probably hijacked. Again, relaying the news to the U.S. military would be delayed, this time by half an hour. <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Steve O'Brien of the Minnesota Air National Guard happened to be in the Washington area that day. He took off from Andrews Air Force Base at 9.30 in a C-130 cargo plane. Unaware of what was going on, he was pointing out the sights of the national capital to his crew. Then air traffic controllers asked him to look out for the American Airlines plane. In fact, the hijacked aircraft was about to collide with him. At that time, we had been converging to the point where he had started to roll up into about a 45 degree bank turn and was almost filling up our entire windscreen. It was fairly close. I'd say you know, within a half mile or so. Then maybe five, ten seconds later, they came back and asked us if we still had them in sight, and if we did, they'd like us to follow the aircraft. And that was strange, because I've never, in 20-some years of flying, have I been asked to follow an aircraft, especially a commercial uh, aircraft. American Airlines Flight 77 would crash into the Pentagon at 9.37 a.m. We saw the explosion, and uh, I knew right away what had happened. The way it hit the Pentagon, it didn't look like it was an accident. I mean, most pilots, if they've got an emergency going on in their aircraft, they're going to do everything they can to avoid populated areas and certainly avoid, you know, hitting a big building if they can. After the Pentagon was hit, Richard Clark gave the order to evacuate the White House. On a given day, there are probably a couple thousand people uh, in that area. And we evacuated all of that very early on. Uh, just told people to leave uh, and get out of the city. As almost everyone was rushing out of the White House, the president's senior advisor, Karen Hughes, was on the way in. I walked in and there was no one there. Everyone that I'd seen had had guns drawn looking as if they were ready to, you know, use them if need be. And so I didn't want to surprise anyone. I remember yelling, hello, <laughs> hello, is anyone here? And uh, two uh, Secret Service agents ran around with their weapons drawn, uh, ran into the foyer, 
And then they, uh, once they realized it was me, took me to meet the vice president. After the Pentagon was hit, the vice president had been taken to a bunker deep in the ground under the White House. He ordered emergency measures designed to ensure continuity of the U.S. government in the event of nuclear war. Around Washington, senior government officials were rushed off to bomb shelters and other secure locations in case more planes hit more key decision-making centers. At 9.42 a.m., the senior air traffic controller in the United States ordered that all planes land immediately at the nearest airport, a high-risk procedure that had never been attempted. Someone did say, you know, are you sure you want to do that? But uh, at that point, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And uh, I, th I felt it, we had to do something uh, to change the texture of the whole thing occurring. And at least this would separate the, uh, the good guys from the bad. And what was left up there would have the military to deal with. But the military had no plan to deal with the last hijacked flight on September 11th. United 93. At 9.23 a.m. on 9-11, an alert flight dispatcher at United Airlines had sent out a text warning to his airline crews. Beware any cockpit intrusion. Two aircraft hit World Trade Center. The captain of United Airlines Flight 93 was confused by the message and wrote back at 9.28, Confirmed last message, please. Apparently, he did not secure his cockpit because two minutes later, his radio was transmitting the sound of the hijackers attacking. Air traffic controllers realized immediately that United 93 had been hijacked. But again, incredibly, no one advised the military. United 93 turned and aimed at Washington. One of the aircraft that looked like it was hijacked appeared to be heading on a line toward Washington. Uh, and so we were being, the meeting was being interrupted every few minutes with word of where that aircraft was and how far out it was. Uh, and it really did look at one point uh, as though an aircraft was coming straight to the city. FAA headquarters officials were supposed to notify the military but staff members there were recorded dithering about the hijacked United flight. Uh, they're pulling Jeff away to talk about United 93. Uh, do we want to think about uh, scrambling aircraft? Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, that's a decision somebody's going to have to make probably in the next 10 minutes. Uh, you know, everybody just left the room. Apparently, there was only one person at FAA headquarters who was authorized to call in the military. Ben Sliney was told that no one could find that person. I said something like, uh, you know, well, I mean, that's incredible. There's only one person. You know, there must be someone designated that, you know, or someone who will assume the responsibility of issuing an order. You know, we were becoming frustrated in our attempts to get some information on what was the military response. United 93 crashed into a field in Pennsylvania at 10.03 a.m. It was brought down by the heroic actions of its passengers, who prevented it from slamming into Washington. The military only found out about the hijacked flight after it had already crashed. United 93, have you got information on that yet? Yeah, he's down. He's down? Yes. When did he land? Because we have confirmation. He did, he did not land. Oh, he's down? Yeah, he's somewhere up northeast of Camp David. Northeast of Camp David. That's the, that's the last report. They don't know exactly where. In New York, at one minute before 10 o'clock, the unthinkable happened.
After the first tower collapsed, Timothy Duffy was asked to fly over and have a close look at the second tower. So I told him, I'm gonna take a look at it from above. Uh, so I flew kind of right up over the top of it and just banked the plane up so I could look down and see it. Yeah, it looked really good to me. You know, I was looking at it, it looked straight up and down, no problems, no leaning or twisted of any kind. And I, I was literally just getting ready to key the mic saying, I think you can save it. When, as I was looking at the, uh, at the roof, it was just a perfect square. It just started getting smaller. And, you know, for a few seconds, I really didn't know what I was looking at because I didn't have anything to, you know, to put it in uh, proper perspective until I saw the plume coming out of the bottom and I realized it was falling away from me. To this day, it is unclear who was really giving the most critical orders on 9-11. The most controversial question regards the order to shoot down commercial airliners if they were hijacked, an order which could have killed hundreds more innocent people. The 9-11 commissioners have suggested that the president and the vice president have not been forthcoming about that issue and that the truth has yet to be revealed. The record shows that between 1010 and 1015 in the White House bunker, the vice president was asked if military pilots could shoot down any hijacked aircraft headed for Washington. He immediately gave the order. The problem is that only the president had the authority to do so. Later, both Mr. Bush and Mr. Cheney claimed to the 9-11 Commission that the president actually gave the shoot down order about 15 minutes earlier but the White House call records do not support their claim. Is it clear to you who gave that order? No, it is not clear to me who gave that order. And, and why, how is it we don't know that? Because the principals haven't said. Uh, the president and the vice president are the only ones that can clarify that completely, and we just don't know what happened there. The other astonishing fact about the shoot-down order is that it was never relayed to the fighter pilots who might have carried it out. No, we never got the order. What we were told is you can expect to shoot down the next hijack track. It was kind of informational only. There was no order, no authentication, uh, nothing even remotely close to what would be required to, to, to fire on a plane. The idea that the President of the United States can have an order and the Air Force doesn't get it, uh, that's serious stuff. There is one pilot who received a shoot-down order, but he was not in a position to execute it. Mark Saskill flies out of Andrews Air Force Base, just a few kilometers from the White House. He received the order not through the proper military channels, but directly from the Secret Service in the White House bunker with the Vice President. Desperate to get some protection over Washington, he took off in the only jet available, which was unarmed. If he encountered a hijacked aircraft, his plan was to ram it with his F-16 and try to eject at the last minute. Well, I'd have one hand on the stick and the other on the ejection handle, and hopefully I could play it right to, to get out after I did hit the airplane. Basically, I'd try and swing my wing into his, again, knock the engine pot off, or, or cut the wing if I could get going fast enough. And, uh, and I wouldn't use my fuselage to do that, but pretty soon after that, my aerodynamic capabilities would be destroyed, and then if I could have ejected, I would have. In Washington, government workers were told to go home Many employees at the Central Intelligence Agency did not appreciate that order. And when there's a crisis, an embassy is attacked or whatever, there's rioting, we go out and seek the, 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 you know, the crisis. We don't, you know, we don't run away from it. At the Air Traffic Control Command Center, the staff watched the amazing sight of every single aircraft over the United States landing at the nearest airfield all following the command of Ben Sliney. 
There were some 4,300 or so planes. They were all landed in two hours and 20 minutes, I think. I did not want to hear about another plane either heading towards something or being intercepted or, you know, God forbid, crashing. In the afternoon, the president landed at the Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. Because of the communications problem on Air Force One, he was transported to an underground bunker there. Just before 3 p.m., Mr. Bush began a teleconference with the White House and the Pentagon. As soon as he sat down, uh, he said, I'm returning to Washington. And we said, no. <laughs> well, I think the vice president first said, no, that's not a good idea. And he said, look, I am returning to Washington. I've decided. Air Force One is out there getting refueled. When it's ready, I'm coming back. So you've got however long that takes to tell me what's going on. Late in the day, when the president finally returned to Washington, he found out about the intelligence failure that led to 9-11. And he set the United States on a path to war. When the president arrived back at the White House on September 11th, he was told that the FBI had identified the names of two known Al-Qaeda agents, Khalid al-Midhar and Nawaf al-Hazmi, on the passenger list of the plane that hit the Pentagon. Now, the president became aware that night that there had been a mistake involving CIA and FBI and their sharing of information. He had the same attitude that I did, which was outrage. I was flabbergasted. I couldn't imagine that the FBI knew the names uh, of people in this country who were Al-Qaeda. And yet these people were allowed to get on airplanes under those names, not using false identity. I, I was just mind-boggled. Why hadn't the FBI told uh, the Transportation Department that they were looking for these people? Why weren't they on the, on the do not board list? Uh, well, on 9-11, that wasn't the day or the time to spend a lot of effort trying to answer that question. That same afternoon, Ben Sliney discovered that FAA headquarters had issued a terrorist hijack alert three months earlier. He was shocked. That hijack alert wasn't transmitted to air traffic control. That hijack alert was transmitted to airlines. And I say with dismay because I think we would have reacted, I, I believe in my heart, we would have reacted so much quicker to that. You would have had 16,000 sets of ears and eyes and very inquisitive uh, minds looking at everything that's, uh, that would, could possibly be suspicious with that type of information in our heads. On the evening of September 11th, Richard Clark drove home through the deserted streets of Washington he stopped and gazed at the smoldering Pentagon. It's sort of the kind of hockey game where if the other team scores one goal, you've lost the game. Uh, and when they, when they launched that attack on September 11th, we all felt that they had won uh, and we had lost. It used to be that, that America felt our oceans protected us, that we were somehow a little less vulnerable to perhaps those type of attacks than, than other countries uh, across the world. But at that day, um, our entire view of America's security changed, and it caused our national security team and the president to, to reevaluate uh, America's security in light of this very different threat in the world. From the beginning of the Bush administration, Richard Clark says that he did everything in his power to coax them into action against Al-Qaeda, without success. In the 24 hours following 9-11, the Bush team was ready to go to war. But Mr. Clark says they picked the wrong target. Well, in meetings on September 11th and on September 12th, the Defense Department officials, including Secretary Rumsfeld, began talking about the need to attack Iraq. Now, I first thought they were kidding, and it became clear they weren't. Uh, Rumsfeld said, well, yeah, we could attack Afghanistan, but there aren't very many targets to bomb in Afghanistan, and they're not worth very much. 
uh, so we should bomb Iraq where there are much better targets. And I thought, but there's no connection between what just happened and Iraq. That didn't seem to bother them. Uh, I said, well, attacking Iraq actually will make it more difficult for us to get the kinds of support that we need in the world, particularly in the, in the Muslim world. That didn't seem to bother them. Secretary Powell tried to have a restraining uh, influence on this discussion. Secretary Powell said, look, the world is not going to understand if we don't go after Afghanistan. That's where that, the attack of September 11th was launched from. So reluctantly, during the course of the week, uh, the Defense Department came around to a consensus, and the consensus was called Afghanistan first. And that's what the president approved, an Afghanistan first policy. It was very clear what was second, and what was second was Iraq. There has been a lot of controversy about the Bush administration's truthfulness about 9-11. Even eight months after the attack, Condoleezza Rice maintained that there had been no warnings. I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane and slam it into the World Trade Center, take another one and slam it into the Pentagon, uh, that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked airplane as a missile. One could not have not, not known about that. There were, you know, known plans to us to, to uh, fly a plane into the CIA. We, had, we, we certainly knew about uh, other operations in other parts of the world involving flying a plane into a target. So it was on everybody's radar screen. And I don't accept the, the argument somehow this was, couldn't have been imagined or something. It was very much something that people understood was a potential method of attack. From the 1995 intelligence estimate, which predicted terrorists would use airplanes as weapons to attack U.S. landmarks, to the hijacking threats that were communicated to the president in August 2001, there were a lot of warnings on the path to 9-11. Many of them came through the counterterrorism chief at the White House. Mr. Clark, could I ask you to raise your right hand so we place you under oath? Richard Clark testified as the star witness before the 9-11 Commission in March 2004. I do. In a statement, Clark apologized to all the families who lost relatives on 9-11. Your government failed you. Those entrusted with protecting you failed you. And I failed you. We tried hard, but that doesn't matter because we failed. This is a failure of government right down the line. Whether it's the intelligence agencies, whether the immigration people, whether it's the FAA, whether it's, a, you know, you, you name the agency. They all shared here in a culpability. There's nobody who worked for the United States government in that period who doesn't share some part of the, some part of the responsibility. Richard Clark quit his job as counterterrorism director in the Bush administration. At the end of his long war against Al-Qaeda, he was left with an overwhelming feeling of guilt. I think everybody involved uh, in the counterterrorism effort prior to September 11th feels guilty that they didn't do more. Or if they don't feel that way, they ought to.